Scripture reading this morning will be Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he ex- ex- existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Good morning. It is what a wonderful day it is to be here. It's snowing. And you know me, I love the snow. I think it's supposed to snow all afternoon. So far since I've stood here during class and worship, it's been snowing the whole time. So uh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Great blessing, not just for the area, for the moisture, but also uh, just to, just for the side of the eyes to, to look out and see the white at it almost puts a smile on every face. I know there's a couple of grumpy ones out there. I see you, John. Oh, I know it doesn't make travel easy, but man, it sure does make the landscape beautiful, doesn't it? We serve such a wonderful God, one who loves us and obviously cares for us. And what a privilege it is to be here this morning in worship and adoration of that God and reminding one another and our own selves of how great He truly is and the impact that He has on our lives. We're so so thankful for that. We're thankful that you're here this morning, especially if you might be visiting with us. Uh, If you're looking for a church home, a family to identify with, someone to help you get to heaven, look no further than the Brighton Church of Christ. I want you to know that you're welcome here and you're wanted here. You're wanted here by people who love you. You may say, oh, but you don't know me. Well, we don't have to know you personally. Know that we love you spiritually. And if you're looking for something like that to help you get to heaven, then you found home. And we can just say, welcome home. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the beard. Oil flowing down the beard. Down the beard of Aaron. (laughs) Onto the collars of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Psalm 133. In those three short verses, we have this this, uh, picture that is painted about God's people and their unity with one another. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together. In unity, when we recognize that God wants His people to be unified, He says it is like this precious oil on the on the head, running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robe. The idea is that that there's so much of this precious oil; it is it's a it's a continual supply over and over, uh, something to be desired. It is like the dews of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. That which affects that far away, Mount Hermon, and yet the benefits are seen all the way down at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And then he says, for there, for where? For in brethren dwelling in unity, in the congregation of the Lord, the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore, life. Not not just plodding along the day-to-day 
treadmill that we see in Ecclesiastes of earthly life on, under the sun, but, but here he's speaking of life beyond the sun, life beyond the here and now, life forevermore. Jesus kept calling it eternal life. And we hold that idea dear to us. Since the inception of the church, unity among Christians has been paramount for church growth for inroads into the community to change and impact the lives of those around us and for personal Christian strength. Think about it, how unity of the church, unity of the brothers and the sisters here, uh, it, it not only grows the church, but it strengthens us as individuals. And when Christians are unified, when we come together and we work together Instead of being atomized by individual interests and small groups pulling in separate directions, when we come together, the potential of the church is multiplied over and over and over. Paul understood the power of unity. Here he was under house arrest in, in Rome, and yet he is compelled to write these, these letters to the different churches, what we refer to as his prison epistle. In one of those, in the letter to Philippi, the, the church was, was facing division and corruption from the world, and, and Paul writes a friendly exhortation. In fact, those who study Paul's letters, especially his prison epistles, but really all of the Pauline corpus, recognize that Philippians is one of the most friendly, the one that shows the greatest amount of love, of the greatest encouragement for love, uh, and a, the deepest relationship of kindness and friendship between Paul and the church at Philippi. And so he writes this friendly exhortation that is indelibly marked by his great love for the saints at Philippi. Though his mission is somewhat corrective, Paul cannot help but, but speak of his joy with them. In fact, he would say toward the end of his letter, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. And he says that because it has been a highlight through all of the, the exhortations of the previous chapters. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And so they form like the floodwaters running beneath everything else that he wrote, and that is the, the true joy of the world. And as we're coming up on this holiday season and people are saying, oh, joy to the world, joy to the world, the true joy to the world is found in a solid, confident relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't begin and end in the manger. But it begins there and it ends on the cross. And everything in between is significant to drawing us closer and closer to Christ in a deeper and deeper relationship with Him. And so we've been looking at studies in the letter to Philippi, joy to the world, and looking at the things in this letter that Paul or that sparks Paul's joy and, and, and gleaning from it some of the things that we as Christians today part of the same body of Christ today, following the same Savior today, in fellowship because of the same work of God today, as Paul and the Philippians did in the first century. We are one in all of these things. We are one. And if we can find what caused joy for Paul, then maybe we can find that same joy in our lives today. So we open chapter 2, and I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Paul continues on a theme that he really established back in chapter 1 and verse 27, when he says, that I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. It's the idea of unity. And in fact, as the prisoner of the Lord points at the unity uh, he says in this context that it, it completes his joy. And so what we, we are titling this lesson is that there is the joy of unity. That when, when brothers and sisters dwell together, it should bring our hearts joy. It should swell us with joy. Let us rejoice in that fact. And it's reminiscent all the way back to Psalm 133, right? Behold how good and pleasant. That word pleasant serves here as a synonym for the idea of joy. How joyful when brothers dwell in unity. 
So important is that unity that he describes really in this context, these first couple of paragraphs, the the basis for the unity that we should rejoice in, the mindset for unity, followed lastly by the example of unity. Let's look at the basis of our unity first. Paul begins with an appeal to the Philippians based upon four conditions. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. So he starts off and, and he uses the conditional in the Greek the, uh, from, the, from the word aeon, and he uses that word four times in this verse. If, 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 the, the ESV drops them after the, after the first one, but essentially it's if there is any encouragement, if there is any comfort from love, if there is any participation in the Spirit, if there is any affliction or affection and, and sympathy. And so uh, he uses it as a rhetorical device, which is uh, uh, something that we should recognize. He's building the ideas, these, these different clauses up on one another, and, and he's using it rhetorically, meaning that, that it's not that Paul is wondering if there is any comfort in Christ, but because Paul knows there is comfort in Christ. And so some translations pick up on that, the way he's using the conditional here and, and will translate this, uh, so or therefore, since there is encouragement or comfort in Christ, since there is comfort from love, since there is fellowship or participation in the Spirit, since there is affection and sympathy, the first of the clauses connects directly to their, their suffering. Remember, Back in chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, when he says it has been granted to you or gifted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. And so we we saw last week how uh, uh, suffering for Christ was part of the gift of Christ. And we sometimes think, well, the the suffering is is too much. you know, I, I, I saw a t-shirt the other day uh, that, that said, uh, whatever you are, I'm strong enough now. <laughs> and it was a play on the words of, you know, whatever doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. And I, I'm stronger now. <laughs> In other words, uh, you, know, you sufferings, you burdens, you trials can leave me. I've had enough. I'm strong enough now. And, and yet here's, here's what Paul is saying is that, that it is a great blessing. It is a gift from God. In fact, the word granted here in the ESV uh, uh, shares the same root word as the joy and the rejoicing that Paul talks about throughout the the letter of Philippi, uh, of Philippians. And and, and he's saying that this is part of uh, of the, the joyousness is this gift of God. And this gift is this, this suffering for the sake of Christ. And now he opens chapter two and he says, but look, It's not as if he has given you this gift of suffering and said, all right, good luck with that, have fun. But it says, uh, 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 therefore, since he has given you this this suffering, this this trial for the sake of Christ, since he has given you this, guess what he's also giving you? He's giving you comfort or encouragement to endure through the suffering. And that's the idea of this first clause. If there is any encouragement in Christ... Paul and the Philippians have been given this opportunity to suffer for Christ's sake, but but they are comforted by by that same Christ. In other words, He didn't leave you comfortless in the midst of your struggles. He's given you the strength to get through. This clause is less about how we encourage one another. In some translations, the ESV is one of them uh, uh, that that says if there is any uh, encouragement in Christ. And so some people have taken this and said, well, see, what he's talking about here is how we encourage one another in the church, the encouragement we share with one another. But while the word can be translated encouragement, it really carries the idea of comforting. And and it's more objective than the subjective things of, you know, let's encourage one another. It's more about how Christ comforts us in the midst of our struggles. It's like the old poem, Footprints, you know, when the, the guy's looking back over his life and the footprints in the sand, and it's, there's usually two sets of footprints, but 
But in the most difficult moments of your life, he recognizes there's, there's just one set of footprints, and he's come to this conclusion that that must mean that, that in his hour of trial, Jesus left him, and he, he, he begs for an explanation. He demands his explanation from Christ. And Jesus explains, Oh, my child, it was then that I carried you. He doesn't just allow us to face the struggles. He, he comforts us and encourages us in the moments of those struggles. If there is any comfort from love, it's not the same word as the word that's translated encouragement, but they are very closely associated to one another. The idea here is of that of solace. If we can take solace and comfort in the love that we have received, but exactly what love is identified is not clear. Is this the love that we have for one another? And certainly we find solace in a family that is filled with love toward one another. Is this the love that Christ demonstrated for us? We've introduced the idea of Christ in the first clause. But that, that we have a, an encouragement or comfort from Christ or in Christ. And certainly Christ has shown His love for us, and He's going to get down in the latter part of this paragraph and show that love demonstrated in, in Christ leaving heaven and coming to earth. So no doubt we have solace in the love from God or from Christ. Is this the, the, the love of the church toward the world, that we, we love those who are lost and who are dying, and that that there's a solace for them in the love that we are willing to share with them. Any one of those things are, are right and proper. But when we come to, the, to Paul's writings, most often when he talks about love, he's speaking of love from God toward us. It's interesting. For example, in, in, based upon his usage, uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, he says that the love of God has been poured abroad into our hearts. I, I love that picture. It reminds me of Vermeer's milkmaid. She's standing there at the basin and she's pouring the milk into the basin. That's what I picture. I picture God is, is holding the pitcher and, and as he tips it forward, it's his love that is pouring out. And our hearts, our hearts are this basin that is receiving everything that He can pour out, and we're starving for more. I believe Paul is, is looking at this love of God that is poured abroad in our heart. In fact, this verse, uh, verse 1, very closely uh, uh, follows the wording of, of uh, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You have there this, this picture of the, of the grace of Christ, uh, much like the comforting of Christ here. You have this, this love of God, and, and over here we have this, this uh, uh, solace from love. And then back over here in 2 Corinthians, you have this fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and back over here we have the participation, or literally, uh, probably better translation, the fellowship of the Spirit. It's the same wording, same word that is used in both contexts. And so this is the love of God that He pours into our hearts. Then the third clause, their fellowship. Is there, if, there's any, if there's any participation or any fellowship in the Spirit, their fellowship with one another comes through their relationship with the Holy Spirit. He is the one Spirit in which they stand firm. All the way back in chapter 1 and verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit. The ESV has a lowercase s here. It might be considered a lowercase s in that, in that we'd have the same attitude, but I think, especially when you take it from Paul's perspective, it's a capital S, that we're standing firm in the one Spirit, that we are endeavoring to maintain the unity of the Spirit, Ephesians 4 and verse 3. He is the conduit through which God's love is being poured into our hearts. Back in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, through the Spirit. He is the conduit through which He is pouring it. 
The Spirit is the regenerating power in our hearts, Titus 3, 5 through 7. Thus in Him we have fellowship, we have partnership. And if you look at those three clauses, as He begins this this, uh, uh, basis of their unity, it has a very Trinitarian flavor to it, doesn't it? Especially if we take the love to be from the Father. So you have the Christ, you have the Spirit, you have the idea of the Father. And the basis of the unity that we share is God. The fullness of the Godhead. Because of their work in our lives, we, we seek a closer relationship with one another. We call Him Father. And we have fellowship with others who call Him Father. Christ, we call him brother. Hebrews 2 says he's not ashamed to call us brother, so we call him brother. Joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8. And we call brother all those who call him brother. And then the final clause moves from the divine power really to our human association. Since there is affection and sympathy, while God works to bring unity We are charged to work to maintain the unity of the Spirit, Ephesians 4 and verse 3, through affection and sympathy, through personal connection with one another. There is affection and sympathy. And then he gives us the idea of the mindset of unity in verses 2 through 4. Beginning in verse 2, he says, Since these things are in place, since God's work and our work are in place, Now, here's what I want you to do. Complete my joy. And he speaks it in the imperative. This is of utmost importance. Complete my joy. Fulfill my joy. Bring it to its greatest fruition. It should not be taken as a a self-centered desire of Paul. Now, I want you to do this for me. But rather, understood as, as, as his personal joy, his utmost happiness is wrapped up in the welfare of the church. We might say, as goes the church, so goes Paul's joy. What brings us ultimate joy? Job satisfaction? Grandkids? A winning sports team? What brings us joy? For Paul, we we would almost expect him to say, here's how my joy will be completed. That I get a fair trial before Caesar. Or, Or that after my trial or at my trial, I am acquitted of these false charges against me. We could see Paul finding joy in acquittal, right? Could we see Paul finding joy maybe in Release from house arrest. The shackles unlocked, the chains dropped, and the door opened and him and able to walk out a free man. Would there be joy in that? Maybe in Paul's mind, there's joy and retribution for those who have done this to me. They will get their just desert. Or maybe if he has to stay in prison, maybe it's something like, if I can just get a better meal. (laughs) Or an apology. That's not what Paul says. Despite all the injustices done to him, his joy is not wrapped up in his personal circumstance, but it's wrapped up in the advancement of the church. And most specifically, not the advancement of small segments of the church, but of the church as a whole. Can we say that our joy is completed when we see the church thriving? We can say those words, but if we're not actively seeking that end, What does that betray about our true joy? That it lies somewhere else. 
in the earthly things, the temporary things, the things that are transient, the things that will be burned up. We need to refocus our minds like him. Well, how do we do that? How do we get this mindset of unity? There's three, three things that are part, three parts of this mindset of unity. And, and the first one is this concept of harmony. Notice he says, I want you to complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He uses two words here. Uh, the first one is phroneo, where we get the study of phrenology. And uh, that's the idea of, uh, uh, of the study of the mind, or uh, I guess technically it's about massaging the head, but still we get the idea of the mind from the head. And the other word that he uses is the word suke, where we get psyche or psychology, psychological. Both having to do with the mind. They're, they're not exactly interchangeable, but, but they both have to do with that inner uh, intellectual belief, core value system of mankind. And he says, he says here's how you are going to fulfill my joy, that, that, that you are of the same mind, that you have a harmony of mind, a unity and harmony of thought. In fact, this idea of, of the mind or the mindset is one of the key motifs in Philippians. How Christians think. For example, in 3 and verse 15, he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. Later in, in chapter 3 and verse 19, when he's talking about those who are enemies of the cross, he says, he says that, that, that they, uh, they mind are with their minds are set on earthly things. It's the same, same idea, phroneo. Their minds are set on earthly things. In contrast, those of us who are mature are to think on these things, right? Or, or you get down to chapter 4 and verse 8, and there's this that, that, that lengthy discussion. If there's anything uh, 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 praiseworthy, if there's anything good, if there's anything worthy, right? And, and he finishes that verse with what? Think on these things. You see, the Christian mindset, where our minds go, is, is, is central to the book of Philippians. And here Paul tells them to have a harmonious mindset, being of the same mind, sharing that same mindset, having the same love that our, our emotions toward one another are also filled in that, that same unity or harmonious idea. Being in full accord, an interesting word, is from that, that word suke, which, by the way, most often is translated soul, our soul. And what he says is that I want you to be joint souled. Uses the prefix uh, S U M on this one, where we, same place where we get sympathy, S Y M, to feel along with. This is to soul along with. That our souls ought to be joined together. Now, when you talk about souls, even in our modern English, when we talk about someone's soul, we're talking about something uh, on the deep inner parts of mankind. It's his soul. Right? He says, I want you to be fully joined together in your soul and have one mind. What he has done is he, is he said you need to be in harmony through the whole man, through the whole man, mind, heart, and soul. When we, when we desire that, we find true unity. Secondly, he goes on and he says in verse 3, it's the idea of humility. Our humility. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I have an, a first edition of the ESV. Newer ESVs say, do nothing by selfish ambition. Paul's already used this word once before. He used it back in chapter 1 and verse 17 when he said, some are seeking to preach out of Selfish ambition or rivalry. 
you get the idea that there's conflict in the church at Philippi. And that conflict has been introduced over people looking out for number one. Selfish ambition. Rivalry. I've got to be the best. I've got to be better than everybody else at the expense of everybody else. And Paul says that is hurting the church. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. Kino doxia or doxia. It's a compound word from kino meaning empty and doxia meaning glory. Empty glory. Do nothing for the empty glory of men, the rivalry of this world, for what people think counts. But rather, he says, in humility. Humility first sees self in its proper importance. Not that we are insignificant, but that others are worthy of our sacrifice. How often do we read of people who have made a personal sacrifice to train for this competition or to work toward this job goal and they've made this sacrifice? We are longing to make a sacrifice for ourselves. Or maybe we'll make a sacrifice for our family. Paul says, I want you to make a self-sacrifice for the church, for brothers and sisters in Christ, because every one of them is worth it. Oh, but he's wayward. He's worth it. She's not as strong as she needs to be. She's worth it. He's the exemplar of our congregation. He's the most faithful of all. He is worth it. By the blood of Christ, we have all been made worth that sacrifice one for another. Humility also eschews this idea of vain glory, but instead counts others as this this more significant. And, And when we talk about humility, it is a uniquely Christian virtue. You see, we don't, we don't get it when we see in, in Rome, they thought humility was a detriment. In American culture today, humility is weakness. Only in Christ does humility make any sense at all. And it is one of the prized virtues Paul, I think it's important to understand that he bases his idea of our humility not upon worth and value, but upon our creatureliness. In other words, our view of ourselves before the Creator. God, the Creator. And we are the created. Our lowliness is before God who who put the welfare of humanity ahead of Himself in Christ. The third mindset of unity is that of selflessness. Verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but to the interest of others. The servant heart is one of the most powerful forces in the church. To minimize division and pettiness and haughtiness and pride and selfishness and and a host of other heart diseases in the church, we should be determined to serve one another. It's hard to bicker and complain and point fingers when my hands are involved in serving you. When our hearts are engaged in serving you one another. My wife is worried at this point because she knows I've got a third point. I'm already 12 minutes over my time. So here's, here's, here's the promise I will make to you. 
Come back tonight. We will finish this sermon. Because let me, let me just give you the, 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 the quick upshot here. Having a hard time leaving this one behind. Because it is one of the most beautiful and fully developed Christological passages in the entire Bible. And it tells us who we serve and what he has done. And I don't have another 45 minutes to give it justice. That's what I want to give it. That's what it deserves. So I don't want to cut it short. And, and I'm sorry if you can't make it back tonight. I realize that, that you're as heartbroken as I am. But I want you to know Him. I want you to know what He's done. And I want the excitement of that to be what, what draws us together as a church, every one of us. We see the work of God already in verse 1. We, we see that, that type of mindset we are to have. But tonight we'll come back together and we'll see it exemplified in Christ and all that He has done. But this morning, don't leave here thinking, well, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm close enough or I think I'm doing pretty good. Listen, if you're struggling with any part of this, if you're struggling with that, that unity effort, if you're struggling with, with staying dedicated or finding some, some goal to draw you together, let it be God. Let it be Christ. And this morning, if you're ready to come and give your life to Him, all things are ready for you. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?